Uh, oh, welcome to the web comics panel. The um, Dragon Con tradition. I don't know how many years we've been doing this. A long time. Uh, we we always enjoy it. Uh, a lot of the same faces, some new ones. So uh, why don't we introduce ourselves? Um, start on the end. That end. My end? <laughs> you started this. Okay. Okay. I'm Bill Holbrook. I create Kevin and Kel plus on the fast track and safe havens. I'm Mel White. I'm a creator of Duncan and Mallory and a retired webcomic called Coyote. I'm Obi Breeden. I'm uh, Jenny's other half. I work on the Devil's Panties. I'm Jenny Breeden. I do. I'm the Devil's Panties. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm John Lodshaw. I do Accidental Centaurs and I work with Guy Gilchrist on uh, Nancy. I'm, I'm Adam and I'm You're plugging this mic stand, which isn't plugged in. It's mostly for show, <laughs> uh, but I feel like a rock star with it. Don't take it away. Uh, I'm Adam Withers. I'm one half of Comfort and Adam. Uh, my wife Comfort and I make the Uniques and Rainbow in the Dark. I think this is on now. I get to be the rock star. Okay. Um, you are. And I'm uh, Laura Innes. I do the webcomic The Dreamer. I also do Winona Earp for IDW, which is not a webcomic, but. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry. <laughs> no, 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 sorry, brother. No, no, sorry, What do you mean? That was really what you mean. <laughs> I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, we're. Um, Probably, probably we ought to start by acknowledging that a lot of us have been working a long time at this business. So um, one of my first questions was, how do we keep our creativity going after all these years? Um, it's a challenge to do an episodic work a, for a long time and keep it interesting to the readers and also to the artists and the creators. So my first question is, how do we keep the creativity going over time? Who wants to start? I can, I can, um, so I actually had a guy come up to my table and he was telling his friends about the, um, he was telling my, his friends about my comic and he points to the first book and he goes, it's about a 20 something girl who's just graduated from college and is looking for a job. I was like, yeah, that's book one. <laughs> book nine is a 30-something woman who's dealing with taxes and housing and mortgage. And so, so I, I think definitely it's, when you look at the first Garfield comics, they're completely different. And so everything's going to evolve. And so the comics that you do, that we do now, are definitely different. Ideally, they, they have evolved and changed from the ones that started out. Um, so how you come up with new stuff is that Life is always changing, um, or you just go to Dragon Con for a weekend, <laughs> and you're good for a month, month and a half of material. Who next? Yeah, I think that um, my experience has been that there is a cork in my brain, and once I started really getting into writing, creating, getting it out, it uncorked that bottle and the creativity just started oozing out in a steady stream uh, that sounds much less appealing than it actually is. I apologize for that. Um, once, you, once you get rolling, things start to roll and you'll hit the occasional dry patch, but uh, the thing that helps is to have a goal. The comics that Comfort and I do are very story driven as opposed to like episodic installments, uh, one offs. And when you've got a plot to work with, if you have an ending in mind, whenever you start running dry, you just ask, well, what is going to move me closer to that ending? How do I need to move these characters? How do I need to push this <coughs> plot to get where I want to go eventually? Um, but whatever you can do to unpop that cork and just get things flowing. Now, I ran into this, how do you keep going? When I went back to school and got involved in homework and papers, and as a creator, you're going to run into times when for some stretch of time, life is going to hammer things up and it may not even be possible for you to do the work. In my case, it lasted four years, uh, getting the degree. And so 
I'm still working on trying to get back into it. In addition, I'm struggling with learning a new way of doing things. When I originally did my work, that was back in the days of paper and ink and stuff like that. Now I have a computer and a brand new tablet. Um, I'm using the Galaxy tablet, so I just draw on it like a sketch pad. But I'm having to relearn how to ink and how to use the tools, watching YouTube videos and going, oh, really? My God, <laughs> he did what? <laughs> um, trying to learn to color because coloring for a graphic novel is different than coloring for a web comic unless you really want to spend a lot of time coloring that web comic <laughs> with all the little fine details so in learning both new tools and trying to change time management I ran into a problem it's not so much the creativity I can do the stories like he says it's kinda like a cork you know pop and there it goes but the workflow was where I had the most difficulty and I'm trying by setting time limits and goals and going toward that I disappoint myself a lot of times but if I don't keep going I won't be able to produce the material I basically let my characters be the creative people in my life because I they tell me what's going to happen. I always say that I'm just the first person to find out what happens to them. Um, I will have an intention to go into a certain direction and they will tell me, uh, no, we're going over here instead. So I basically let my character driven strips be driven by the characters and that keeps things fresh and exciting for me and hopefully for the readers too. I see that's something that's always weird to me. I'm a plotter. If you've ever been to writing seminars, you know there are pantsers and there are plotters. And the pantsers, they talk to the characters, talk to them. The voices in my head tell That's me to right. keep going. Us <laughs> plotters, however, it's we're there with our little whips going, uh uh, you're not going there. I got a place for you to go. And you're going there, baby. Yeah, so, I mean, you know, I, it was young voices in my head. Really, I, the, the characters, I've been with them and worked with them for so long that they, I, when I'm, especially when I'm writing, they take over, and the next thing I know, I've written something. Where did that come from? That's much better than what I was planning. And um, so, darn yeah. answer. Yeah, I know, really. <laughs> I think for me, um, I've hit those spots and I've taken breaks. Um, so my web comic has kind of like halted, or the pace has slowed down and updates, and I've allowed myself to do other projects because I know the kind of person I am. Like I really get excited um, about new ideas and things. And so if I only worked on this one thing for like a decade now, I, I would not have been happy. Um, so I think that by putting my hands in other things like podcasting and other comics that I've drawn, that it's like allowed me to come back to the web comic with more, uh, more energy and fresh eyes. And um, just, I guess, going through that process with my readers that as this evolves and as my career grows that this is going to change and it won't look the way that it looked when I started but um, hopefully that's not a bad thing. Uh, next question concerns social media um, which is a excellent way of promoting our work and I'm just interested in how each of us uses social media differently. Who wants to start? Go ahead. Go for it. Um, so the, the magical wizard genie that is my husband has figured out how to automate a lot of the posts. And so when I post my, uh, I have automatic update on my website, when the comic goes up on thedevilspanties.com, it automatically gets updated on the Devil's Panties Twitter, the Devil's Panties Facebook, the Devil's Panties Tumblr, um, and then I have my own Jenny Breeden Twitter and Jenny Breeden Facebook, which I'll actually then repost the comic on those um, because it'll lead them directly back to the, the website itself. And that's where I actually get my advertising income is they have to go to the actual thedevilspanties.com. Um, and I recently realized that I'm reading a lot of webcomics on Instagram, which I 
haven't told my husband yet um, <laughs> that, that I'm, I'm now going and resizing some of the, the panels because on Instagram you can swipe and I found that some web comics will start posting each panel and so as you read it you're swiping to the next panel um, because I had somebody say yeah I follow you on Instagram and I forget why because you post pictures of clouds moving and time lapse and and nothing about web comics or anything. So I, I've started posting my web comic on Instagram. Um, and it, it really is just, we don't actually spend much to advertise the comic. Traditionally on banners, we use social media to advertise the comic. The best advertising turns out to be, it's a social network, right? So if you like something and you have friends, those friends probably are similar to you in some ways. When you share that, you get natural gravity. And you, you really, you can buy it, it costs a lot of money. <laughs> uh, you can pay AdWords as much money as you want to kind of go down this road, but natural advertising among friends is the most powerful way to spread uh, anything at this point. Uh, Comfort and I have found that it's important to balance uh, your social media presence between uh, the product, which is your work, and yourselves, your life, which is your real product. You know, you're selling yourself first. Uh, people need to be able to connect with you as a person. That's what they want. Uh, people want to have a relationship with the creators that they admire, um, the people who are doing the things that they would like to be doing. Uh, to any of us who've been doing this for so long, making comics is, you know, it's, it's a job. This is what we do. It's not particularly exciting. I mean, we, it's fun. I'd rather do this than anything else in the world. I love what I do. But when people are like, oh, so what you been up to? I'm like, eh, same old. But to other people, this is a fantasy. This is a dream. I am living the life that so many people would love to live, and they want vicariously to be a part of that through me. Um, it's tapping into something that I think of as the reward economy. And the reward economy understands that I can get anything I want for free uh, without working very hard to get it. And so I'm going to sample all the things and try out all the things and I'm gonna test everything around to see what's good. And if you've really entertained me, if you've done something that just really gets to me, I'm gonna reward you with my money. You know I don't have to pay you. And I know that I don't have to pay you, but I'm going to because you've done something that matters to me. And I want you to know that you've done something that matters to me. Um, so social media is the most direct and effective way of tapping into that feeling amongst people and letting them be part of your journey. And they will tell you how much they like you and, and how much they like what you do by buying your work, hopefully. I think my mindset has always been like I just want to play with my fans <laughs> um, I just go online where they are and do the things that they do with them and so I've never come at it from like a I'm up here and you're down here thank you I've always approached it as like I'm one of you kind of a thing and so I get into their goofs and I get in with their ridiculous in jokes and um, all of the bad punning that goes on in my blog and uh, and I've just kind of followed that around and allowed myself to change uh, frequently like it used to be deviant art and when that dried up then I moved over into Twitter and Twitter's really active for me right now and there was a time when someone told me like the dreamer is everywhere on tumblr and I was like wait what and uh, went over there so then I got into tumblr and so I just kind of go where my readers are and then if they're doing something and having fun then I'm like I'll get in on that um, and make friends really I think is is my mindset is to legitimately I guess the social networking thing you know to legitimately make friends with the people who read, read my comic and care about them as people and be invested in their lives and like hey you were sick you were in the hospital I know who you are I care about that like are you okay um, those kinds of things that if it's a community then I need to be a member of that community and uh, that's been really important to me you know I think that's actually very important because let's face it there are millions of creators out there think of all the self-published books the people putting up web comics artwork etc you can only see so many I can, you know, no matter how fast I read, I can't read every single book that's put out in one year or even one month. There are just too many of them. So I find myself, I follow Bill's strips regularly. I know Bill, I like Bill, 
and I'm interested in seeing what he's doing. So that personal connection, establishing that, to me, as a creator and a consumer, that's what you, it's all about. I've had people come onto Facebook who were basically often writers who are there mainly to promote their books. And after about the 15th post about their up-and-coming book, I go, you know, I'm just going to quietly unfollow you. We can stay friends, and let me show you when I have something coming around. But there's, uh, I reach a limit. We get advertised to so much overwhelmingly and this information fire hose of ads like you. I want to see what people are doing. I care if they're in the hospital, if, if they were hit by Hurricane Harvey, if they got a flat tire. You care. But I don't really care about the 15th iteration of your book and the blurbs about it. Well, I found out very early that I'm not that interesting. So <laughs> on social media, um, I don't have a Twitter account or a Facebook account, but my characters do. Um, Rudy Duclaw has a Facebook page. Um, on Twitter, one of the characters who is part of the Great Bird Society is struggling to keep the portal between the, our dimension and their dimension in balance. So she reports on that daily. And, uh, and the struggle of that. And Bethany of Fast Track has her own Facebook page and Twitter in which she makes a snarky comment about each daily strip. And that seems to work in that I want the readers to have a connection to the characters more than me. So, as, and thank you for your kind words. <laughs> but um, my characters are much more interesting than anything I could do because I just sit at home in my basement office and draw all day. And if, if I were to have a personal Twitter feed that I drew today, <laughs> I wrote today, and that would be it every day, <laughs> except for when I occasionally venture out to Dragon Con. <laughs> uh, do we want to go to questions from the audience? Is that? Oh, oh, sorry. No, okay, never mind. Well, that was the, that was the, yeah. No, sorry. Sorry. Well, so I what lost track. Yeah, anyway, sorry. I interrupted Bill before interrupting him. Uh, yeah. So how many of you want to do a webcomic or uh, get involved in webcomics? You poor oh. dumb. <laughs> <laughs> no, poor <laughs> deluded. Run. <laughs> Turn back now. They're, Run, away. No. Well, Run away. Run away. How many, um, so who here is doing a webcomic? All right. Oh, nice. Very nice. Well done. Congratulations. Condolences. Yes. We accept you. We accept you. So, who has a question? We'll do. Uh, what hands one more time? We'll do uh, Buffy, gold mask, small child in a white shirt. Oh, golly. Um, <laughs> front row, blue uh, scarf. Sorry, sorry, blue um, uh, cape. Uh, lady in black. Uh, and we got the other mic up. Okay, five. Starting here. We we'll spend more time lining them up than answering questions. <laughs> <laughs> that's the that, that's the strategy. This isn't so much a question, but a tidbit. Um, talking about networking or whatever. I've got a couple dozen web comics I read every day. I got them all from each other. I, I, I got half of them from your website. Sorry. Sorry. So it's your individual, <laughs> it's your individual <laughs> links. So I mean, there's a huge <laughs> connection between web artists that, that really does it. That's a good point. How do you know when you're ready to move from idea and practice to actually putting your work out there? You don't. You no. just do it. Never. Yeah. Never. You're never, never. ready. You're never Ever. Ready. You, don't you, wait for you that. You never know. It won't happen. It still hasn't happened. I've been doing this for 16 years. I'm not ready. I still don't know what I'm doing. You have to do it. We're all making this up as we go along. And if you wait until it looks right, it's never going to be there. I mean, I've got some stuff out on the... Uh, early when I was early doing coyote that really ought to be glorifying a land some will somewhere you know kind of toxic glow in the night EPA cleanup but 
the thing is, it was out there. People liked the stories, and they came for the stories. My daughter is starting to do a web comic as well, and I'm just shoving her, do it, dear, don't, don't fiddle around with it, because she's in the, oh, I want it to look nice stage. There, there's a ton, from schlock mercenary onward, there's a ton of stuff out there that the early material is just rough as you're figuring it out and improves over time. Mm -hmm. That's part of the dance. Art is never finished, only abandoned. Mm -hmm. So just put it out there and move on to the next one. And then move on to the next one and the next one. It's the doing it that makes you good at it. And so if you just sit there thinking about doing it, you never actually get to flex those muscles. Mm -hmm. So just yeah, even stick in. comics. Think of XKCD. I mean, that's stick figures, people. Yeah. You've got no excuse. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Everybody who comes up to our table is like, well, I can't even draw stick figures. I'm like, well, you could be one of the most popular web comics ever made. And actually, there was a black and white comic where the characters were dots. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. In, his, in his likeness. Yes, yeah. and it was gods. It was yeah. absolutely yeah. fabulous. And you'd think, you know, a string of dots on a page with dialogue would be nothing. It was fabulous. Yeah. It really was. Yeah, no. And he drew those dots so well. Oh, my God, the artistry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the hard thing is you're never, as an artist, as a creator, you are never going to be as good as you want to be. You'll keep getting better. Because you're always your worst credit. Well, not only that, but the better you get, the better you'll aspire to be. No matter how good you are, you're like, yeah, but that guy's better. And you might reach that guy, but then you're looking at the next guy. That guy's better than me. Don't, don't. Oh, God. Your reach will always... (laughs) Your reach will always exceed your grasp. That doesn't mean you're not grabbing anything. It just means that you will always be aspiring. And that's a good thing. If you ever reach the point where you're not aspiring to something anymore, you're done. You get out, you're done. You, there's nothing you left for you. And they have a nice service. That's when you. That's when you start petering out, you know. And it happens to artists all the time, and it's really sad to watch. But it is. It is good to yearn for something, as long as you're not allowing that yearning to drive you into a hole where you're too scared to come out. So, do you ever draw inspiration from other comics, web or otherwise? All the time. No, I've never stolen from another webcomic. <laughs> the, the next question was the uh, gentleman in the front row. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Um, no, the, uh, there's definitely a fine line between inspiration and plagiarism. Um, because you definitely have... Um, I've been inspired by... I've had friends who look at my work and they go, Oh, you used to read ElfQuest and Strangers in Paradise. And I was like, yes, actually, because it definitely, what you absorb influences what you do. You just have to make sure you make it your own. I have never, ever looked at ElfQuest or Phil Folio to look at layout (laughs) techniques. Never, ever in my life. (laughs) Or Bill, come to think of it. (laughs) Pablo Picasso said, good artists copy, great artists steal. But make it your own. But make it your own, but still. So... Um, as an artist and illustrator, how do you suggest like breaking out or getting that first thing that you've been trying to get at but you just can't reach yet? Depends on what we mean by uh, <laughs> that first thing. Like, are you talking your first thing as in actually making your book, or are you talking your first thing as in just getting some little freelance job? Because those are a bit two different type. Concepts. You're right, sorry. Um, so just starting out as an artist to be like a freelancer right. and to eventually build up, but like how do you suggest just taking that first step to a more professional well, level? Well, first of all, just try and do like commissions on Facebook. Keep it real simple. You don't have to go work for Tide and do, you know, their logo. <laughs> you can just... Be like, hey, friends, I'm trying to start getting used to doing illustrations. I'm going to do them for 10 bucks. And you see who bites. And you know what? That work doesn't pay much, but it gets you used to being a professional, not just doing your stuff, but doing other people's stuff, and that's real important. Make sure your local laundromat has the best logo on earth. (laughs) Start there. Also, uh, convention art shows. Many art shows are open to 
having small mounted pictures sell some there yeah, the first few are terrifying you go in and oh my god nobody has bid on any peas I'm a failure I'm going to go home and eat worms <laughs> dig in the backyard hide in the basement uh, but then you'll get your first sale and you'll start understanding the important thing for us you have to understand what the audience wants they want something that you're doing but what are they applauding? What do they find charming? What do they find interesting? And oftentimes you can get a sense of this in things like individual mm -hmm. print sales. Mm -hmm. Discover a character yeah. is suddenly more popular than you thought. Well, that's what happened with Bethany in On the Fast Track. Um, I introduced her in 2010, right. thinking I'd get a few goth gags out of her. And the reaction to the audience was, I would, I would, I would just get emails just that said, I love her. <laughs> so that was a signal, do more with her. And now she's pretty much the main character of the strip. Um, my question would be, um, <laughs> no, I'm trying to think of like how to word it. What, um, what program would you use to like create the pages and what, um, uh, so what program would you use and what uh, canvas size? Because I notice a lot of my programs, they look nice, but as soon as I start zooming in, I can see some of the pixels. And I've noticed on uh, the That might be that because your DPI isn't high enough. But also, what's your final, what are you going to do with it? Is yeah. it going to be printed into a comic book? Is it going to be like a, a graphic novel? I think we're looking more just for the web for right now. Just like You cannot don't, don't, go don't wrong. Don't think that way. Don't think, no. think, think for print. Yeah, because yeah, you're yeah. eventually, because eventually you're going to want to have it end up on a piece of paper. Look, look at the cheapest sized book, um, because there are some standard book sizes. Okay. Uh, I use Am I use CreateSpace, and on Amazon, and if you have some of the standard sizes, you can automatically be available in bookstores. Mm -hmm. If you have a specialty size, which is strangely enough a graphic novel size bookstores can't order you off of Amazon. So I would look at the sizing of, of standard books and then start conforming your pages, your comic pages, based on that size. Now, I, would, I, I would also start at um, scanning your work at 600 DPI, because you can always go less, you can't go higher. <laughs> now, if you're creating on the computer, uh, Manga Studio, and I'm just now drawing a blank on its follow-up. Flip, Flip Studio, Studio Pro. Pro. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And Woo. Ibis Paint, also uh, on the Android. They come with some standard sizes, and for those of us who have trouble drawing straight lines, they have tools to make the little panels much easier. The perspective tools in Flip Studio yes. Pro are worth the price of admission. Um, follow uh, Smith Micro is the company that yep. produces Clip Studio. Follow them on Twitter. That program is on sale like every month. Yeah, it was just recently ridiculously yeah. lowly low price. The and entry the entry level version hovers around thirty dollars on average, and you will often get it for less. And it's only missing two features, neither of which you need to use. <laughs> it's not like Photoshop Elements where they hide everything good yeah. but tease you. Um, the base entry level Clip Studio is likely all you would ever need. And they do uh, have a nice set of tutorials and everybody yes. and their monkey does it on and YouTube. Yeah. And uh, YouTube. Ibis Paint was another one. It's not as intuitive to use, but uh, this small, this is one of those pen phones. And sitting, I've done a lot of artwork just sitting around, you know, waiting for various things right here full size and just bring it into actually I bring it into GIMP tweak the colors a little bit tweak the density An, good to go another nice thing with clip studio is that it allows you to it has page management tools there so you can basically do build the book as opposed to having to export everything out to and then bring it into InDesign or Quark is that even still around anymore? I and even know, those yeah, guys, God, please go away, die, God, die, 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 die Quark. But anyway, but uh, I, I mean, I, I still do things in, in InDesign because that's the workflow that I'm used to. But uh, it, it, if you want a one single application, then definitely look at Clip Studio Pro. But anything that is going to give you a high resolution, it's not the tool, it's the artist. True. 
I mean, I mean, th- I mean there, there are there are some some great comics done in Microsoft Paint. Mm-hmm. Uh, hard to believe. I mean, Comic Sans. <laughs> I had to get a Comic Sans joke in. You know. yeah. But it's it, so it, 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 so but but, it, but that's a good tool. But it's not the tool. It's it's the it's the user of the tool. For me, I'm doing an English language manga web manga. I already have three chapters in, but at the same time, I'm also doing a light novel as well. And my question is, is it, is it recommended, like, is it, like, really okay to do, like, two projects at once or just start on one project first, then work on it later? I recommend three. <laughs> <laughs> Four might be good. Yeah. How many does it do take before music. you stop sleeping? Because yeah. that's... That's Sleep. when you know you've almost gotten enough projects. One more after that. Yeah. Usually Sleep. if I get like burnt out or tired of working on one, then I can switch over to the other, yeah. and it's using two different muscle groups. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so when one gets tired, then you can switch and be fresh for the next one. Yeah, I think especially with writing, because it moves faster than drawing, that um, when I, I do like short stories about my characters that are like apart from the main plot, and then I sell those on Patreon. And so it's always nice whenever I get like I'll, I'll, I'll draw comics for a while and then I'll write for a while and then I'll draw comics and then it's kind of like I've got auxiliary content to put in another place and generate income and my own creativity gets broken up and also it's just for me working at home in the same space all the time I can take my laptop out and write I, I, I write all of my stories at a coffee shop just like being in a new space has kind of a different energy and then I get to come back into the office and draw and it kind of breaks my workflow up too Although I want to say for everybody, if you're new to this, don't do several you know, <laughs> stories at the same time. Get one done. If you can do that one, you know you can do this. On to the next thing. Fantastic. But if you're going to pull yourself in a million different directions to start and make it likelier that you don't get either one of those done, no. Pick the easier of the two. Do that. Cut your teeth. And then go to the one you love the most. Mm-hmm and go from there. There there was a gentleman on the front row with the uh, the black lanyard, and then after that there was the the woman in the very back with the the black hat with the ears on it. Oh, Oh, did, okay, sorry. Um, How do you find the motivation to draw and work on your comics and things every day, even the days when you're not feeling motivated? I look at my mortgage. (laughs) I don't. (laughs) Bank balance. I don't want comfort to hurt me. (laughs) Sometimes I find the hardest part. Get somebody like me who's going to kick your ass if you don't get that shit done. (laughs) But you do have to find ways to just motivate yourself. You say, how much am I going to do today? And you set that goal, and you've got to work those muscles to try and get it done. You're not going to be fast when you start, and that's fine. But you say, what can I do now? What's my goal? And how do you stay on track? How do you not fall down a tumbler hole? (laughs) How do you give yourself 10 minutes in between things to make sure you take that 10 minutes of a break, but you don't take more? Motivation is a muscle, and you have to exercise it to develop the ability you can't it's not like a bolt from the blue that inspires you sometimes sure we get lucky we get that kind of divine push most of the time you're cracking the whip on yourself and so you've got to train yourself to be able to do that it's important to have a deadline um when you do a web comic it doesn't matter if you do it once a week three times a week seven days a week but to have a deadline and stick to it so that your audience knows when the strips are coming. That it's a regular thing. Oh, it's so-and-so is, it's a Tuesday. It's, so, it, it's when so-and-so posts. Or it's 1 a.m. This is when so-and-so posts. But as long as it's regular, people get into a routine. And then you have them. You got them. Well, once you're part of their routine. Just, you just have to always meet that deadline. Skipping, for me, missing a post wasn't an option. Like, that wasn't even, early in our relationship, I was like, hey, I've I've got to go home and and post the comic. And he was like, oh, your fans will understand. You can skip it. I was like, oh, I'm going to miss you. (laughs) 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 You're cute. Um, And I've, like, I've, 
And there was at one point I came staggering home from a bachelorette party and I realized I hadn't done a comic for the next day. And so I grabbed a envelope and a Sharpie and I drew a comic and I said, I'm drunk. <laughs> and I posted it and you could even see the envelope. Mar- it was an envelope <laughs> that I had posted with a squiggle on it. And that was my post. And people loved it. God damn it. <laughs> And so it's amazing, you know, when you feel like you're not motivated and you just, like, grab something, anything out of the air and you post that, what's kind of depressing is that sometimes those are your best ideas. (laughs) (laughs) Or going outside for a walk is amazing. Yeah. But just forcing yourself to get started, like once you start on something, it's so much easier to keep working on it. It, A lot of times it's that like beginning jump. I know for me, I was a commercial illustrator, illustrator for several years. And so I just, I went from being a college student who worked like, oh, I could just pull an all nighter and I'll work when I'm inspired and, you know, kind of having freedom of your schedule. But all of a sudden when you're working nine to five and there's a paycheck, then you learn to draw on command. You learn to produce on command. So I would say if that is an issue, are there places that you can find, like practice that like I show up and do it and I don't have to wait for inspiration, whether it's in graphic design or illustration or anything, Um, you know, if there is a paycheck, and or if there is a deadline, things tend to get done with those two things. So if you can find a way to bring that in, and I think web comics is fantastic for that because it has a built-in deadline every week or every so often, it just forces you that you guess you gotta do it. Do you think it's, uh, do you think that I should like finish college before starting webcomic or do you think I should start on it while in college? Start now. Yeah, yeah. I, I found the absolute best comics because uh, I, I started my comic uh, third year. I started drawing comics in college of my friends in the dorms and, you know, just being weird and doing D&D. And then that's what started the webcomic um, because there there is definitely ideas that you're going to get from being in the college environment that you're not necessarily going to get um, working a nine to five, and you know, so so write them down now. Get do what you can right now. Okay, I'm going to take a different tack. What's your degree in? Uh, painting and drawing. Okay. What's your is your comic a like slice of life web comic or is it like a epic story comic? Slice of life. Slice of life. All right. Yeah. Started in college. Both show. Yeah. Yeah, that's a college a slice of life, really very popular. So going back to the borrowing versus blatant plagiarism, <laughs> how do you guys deal with blatant plagiarism, whether you find it or somebody, one of your fans notifies you that it's happened? Do you go and message the person or try to contact the person and say, hey, that's not cool? Or do you involve, is, are there lawsuits? How, how do you guys deal with blatant <laughs> Lawsuits plagiarism? take money. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you noticed. And, 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 and whoever you sue has to have money in order to make it work. Yeah. To make it worth their while. You're wild to yeah. sue yeah. them but too. Not more money than you, because then they could counter. And then they counter sue. Yeah. 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 I've I've accidentally stolen from other people, like people I've never even read before. Um, I I've done I I did I do a I had a, a journal um, LARP comic. And I was bored at the LARP, and they said, hey, there's a pool of chaos, don't go mess with it. And I disappear for a panel, and the next panel is me with a tentacle arm (laughs) going, I was bored. Apparently that's a Penny Arcade story arc. (laughs) I had no idea. And and so on one hand, there are some universal concepts. Um, The concept of wearing a lot of undergarments to make sure you look good in a little black dress. I had a lady email me and say, hey, I think your comic is cute and all. Could you get your fans to stop sending me threatening letters? Because she wrote a blog about wearing a lot underneath to wear a little black dress to look good in. And it was the same concept as a comic I did. And so the, a, a polite email will go a long way. Instead of just, hey, you stole my shit, or, you know, or somebody saying, oh, you stole from this other person, just saying, Either, I honestly didn't know that was a thing, or, hey, this looks really similar to my work. Um, hi. (laughs) (laughs) Is is a lot better than coming out swinging. 
because yeah. sometimes it's, it's reasonable. I think that you need to first understand copyright and parody. You know, when you are, you are infringing and when you aren't, because a lot of things will be similar or look similar. Parody is protected. That's Fair how use. That Mad yeah. Magazine. So you need to know what you're actually dealing with. In cases of outright plagiarism, if you know where to go and if they are doing it online, and if you know the right channels, you can instead hit up the ISP and knock them offline because I've done this with a group of people, uh, ASFA, in order to retrieve people's copyrights. You when you release something on the web, you need to know what copyright you're giving away, possibly. You need to know your rights, and then you need to know when it's infringement and when it isn't. What, one thing is, you can't copyright an idea. Ideas can't be copyrighted. The specific implementation of an idea, yes. Uh, you know, uh, you can't, so you can't copyright the idea behind a certain, behind a ch the, by the chicken cross the road joke, but you can copyright a specific chicken if you put your own distinct spin on it. So, uh, so yeah, that's that's a very important part, and and, 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 and that's going to, and that's going to happen. People, you're going to have there because there are universal jokes. Mm -hmm. There are things that, that are going to come up over and over again, and you're just uh, you you can't possibly know every possible thing that has ever been written by everybody and not. One of these days, you're gonna you're gonna say something that was very similar to something somebody else said, and it, it happens. And so, if it happens to you, and somebody's done, and you know it's pointed out to you, again, a, a kind letter, a kind word, saying, hey, uh, you know, and and they, if you're nice about it, they'll probably say, you know, I'm sorry, I didn't even know that you that you had done this. Uh, it's uh, you know it was a, it was an honest you know creation of some, and and that ha and that happens so understand that happens but if they have gone and taken your artwork and erased your name and put it up and and are selling T-shirts with it that's a different matter that's and when I get lawyers out and that's when you get a and a nasty gram from a lawyer will often go. Uh, a long way, a, a C and D letter from a lawyer, and then they'll they'll they will. They'll, but also, mm -hmm. and, and that's like for 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 these T-shirt vendors that you see on Facebook all the time. Like I get these ones with all of these Snoopy Doctor Who mashup, and I know, I know people at the show's uh, studio. That's not coming from them. No. <laughs> First off, it's a poorly drawn Snoopy, and it's a poorly drawn drawn Tardis. I know it's not them. So, uh, uh, but a, a, a quick, if that happens to you and they're using your artwork for something that you have not authorized, uh, a, 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 you know, that's where it might be worth. Is, isn't it um, Jeff Shackwes of XKCD, he sends a, uh, an invoice? <laughs> he doesn't send it cease and desist, he sends an invoice. An invoice, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But al also, like you were mentioning, the, the, the DCMA has takedown provisions so that you, there are, Avenues that you can go through uh, without having to have a lawyer to say this is my work; it has been infringed upon by this person, and the ISP has to take it down at least while it is being investigated. Uh, but that's a whole panel into itself. Yeah, yeah it rights, is. copyrights, it and, and it is. Down. I mean, it is. It's a very complex area. Yeah. <laughs> oh, right. Yeah. That was this morning. So you have to wait till next year. <laughs> <laughs> A lot That'd of those things will apply to this. Yeah. So. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I was wondering. Um, I'm me and my girlfriend are working on a uh, like an idea for a comic right now. Um, oh, oh, sorry. All right. Yeah, we're working on an idea for the comic right now, and our dynamic um, with it is uh, and mainly it's her idea, um, and she's the artist too. Um, but she's at, like she wanted me to help write it, and so when it comes to these kinds of dynamics, like how do you guys streamline like a writer and artist dynamic sort of? Well, <laughs> well, <laughs> you'll, uh, you'll need an agreement. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Ours was called marriage. Oh, ah, <laughs> uh, it. 
yeah, we're yeah, still yeah. working on that contract, aren't we? No, we don't have one. They're really, no, you read over it, and we wanted to make some stipulations, and you haven't signed it yet, so, which is why I don't use your real name. Awkward. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I love you. We started a thing. My co-creator okay. died, and the uh, person who was managing the estate assumed that the books were his and that he was he was the one who had created the characters, Duncan and Mallory, and sold them out from underneath me. Uh, luckily, we're on very good terms. I got it back. Uh, that, that was a surprise to me. You know, oh, by the way, I've sold it. How much of it was yours? Wait a second. <laughs> yeah. uh, so you need, and I had the letter of agreement. This was an honest misunderstanding. No harm done. It was a sale that I wouldn't have made, so you know it was kind of a bonus, but it was a little bit of a shock. Uh, so these, you need a letter of agreement. You may not get hit by a bus, you know, for dozens and dozens of years, but we've known too many creator couples that have gotten into arguments and separated, and then the product becomes lost in limbo or actually becomes part of the battleground, and it gets really ugly. I think uh, process-wise, uh, what Jenny and I do is, I just, when I write comics, which is not too often these days, uh, used to be much more often before, uh, I would write a script. Like, uh, there was this old website called uh, Comic Robot that used to, like, submit um, scripts to, uh, of web comics. And the format was pretty, you know, pretty decent, so I just used that format, I put it in Evernote, and I have like a pile of scripts that Jenny looks at when I'm not around and draws comments from that. Um, with, oh. with our process, yeah. um, in the most general terms, comfort is extremely good at structure, story structure, and I'm good with polish. She'll do the first draft of every script. I do the second draft. And then she takes it for a third and tells me how dumb I was. And I take <laughs> it for a fourth and I say, nuh uh, comfort. Um, and we go back and forth until we get something we like. And then we send it to editors because we don't trust ourselves to actually know what a good idea is by that point. Um, and that, I think, is, is the best advice I can give is have somebody who can read your scripts, who can be, act as an editor, who will tell you that you suck but not be an ass about it. So that's mm -hmm. that's the creative side, not the yeah. copyright side. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. he's, he's the voices in my head tell me <laughs> when they when they argue. No, um, <laughs> uh, no. I, you mentioned a very good point of of sending it to someone completely outside of the original creative process. I do have a couple of readers that I uh, when I have new pages, I send them to them as very rough doodle outlines with my chicken scratch handwriting. So they can look at it, they can say, you know, that dialogue is a little awkward. And, oh. and uh, one of them is actually a professional editor, and so I'm taking advantage of, of his services. Um, but it comes back, and that helps me to refine the story, refine character, and just make it overall better. And then, actually, I send it back to him when the, when the page is done, if I have time, and he checks it for typos because they, they will crop up. But having somebody who is outside of the creative process, there's a need for an editorial process. I know, Bill, you yeah. to have, an, have an outside editor right. that's in-house. Yes, that's my wife. She so, is a, and that, and that <laughs> she's a published does. novelist, so she knows what she's talking about. Yeah, so, but, but and when she goes through and says, well, this joke is not that good, or, mm -hmm. or it needs to be, what if, you, you know, this one's just not that, needs to be worked on some more. Yeah. And, Mm -hmm. She's a good place. You need somebody to bounce those ideas off that is outside that process so you're getting a fresh ear, just like your readers are going to be when they see your stuff for the first time, when they do, see that page for the first time. Do a little bit of a separation between uh, your relationship <laughs> and your, 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 emotion, your romantic relationship and your business relationship. That we got into a heated argument about uh, a final panel, um, I was like, "Well, that's that's gonna suck." I, I drew it, and then it looked better um, for his idea. And we took a break. We stopped and went and had a sandwich. Mm -hmm. And I was able to calm down and realize that he wasn't saying that I suck. <laughs> <laughs> he was saying that I needed to change it, or you know, that that you really need to be able the communication of the difference of. 
they're not attacking you personally or or your your work. You have to listen to them as a editor or as another artist, and and that is something you're going to have to work on personally of just that separation of business and and personal. Yeah. How are we doing for time? We got about four minutes. Okay. I got so many. Okay. Time. Uh, this is more on the web side of web comics, but I was curious: what are some uh, website pet peeves or things that you see on a web comic site that just make you cringe? Um, not seeing the strip on the f opening page, <laughs> Have, having to click through to actually see the work. Yeah, splash pages are don't don't do splash pages. <laughs> <laughs> comic Sans. <laughs> <laughs> Anywhere, if, I mean, seriously, I, I, I've seen, I know some. There are a lot of web, there are web comics out there that use Comic Sans for the dialogue. Don't use Comic Sans. There are a lot of great <laughs> comic fonts out there that are that are that cost exactly the same amount as Comic Sans that are infinitely better. It just it smacks of amateurism. You, you Don't a, use Comic Sans unless you're making a joke about Comic Sans. <laughs> what's what's the uh, the one that you you. S I made my own font with what was the program? Oh, oh Jesus! That was like five years ago. I don't. I know it was, for, it was on a plane. I did it on a on a fonts on a, a plane. iPad. <laughs> <laughs> I am tired of these. Thank you for that. Let's get another. Um, I know for me, I I make a web comic, and one of the things that I'm most frustrated with is that the amount of time that I have to actually work on it is not what I would like because you know I have a full time job, um, and, you know I've got a make dinner and all that and so what's your suggestion as far as you know make trying to make that tr transition into being able to do it more full-time um, and being able to support yourself with your webcomic learn what you can live without <laughs> um, <laughs> you don't need as much stuff as you think you do you know who moved to Flint Flint Michigan when they were getting their careers off the ground which by the way is everything you've heard right. <laughs> Flint, Flint. these guys here so give up stuff yeah. before you can go professional. I'd also say make your comic scalable. Like, um, don't start out to make like a ten graphic novel fantasy yes. epic with like tons of gradients and shading and stuff. Do something that is much smaller and much more manageable, and then get started on that. And then, so it's something that you can fit into however much time you have. So, like, look at your schedule. How, when are the pockets of time you have to work in it? And per week, with that amount of time, what can you do? And then create an update schedule based on that. Get started with that project and start to build a fan base with that project. And then, if you know, if you start to be able to make money and profit and grow it, then you get to change that and expand it over time. Uh, this is a follow-up to the um, writer-artist collaboration agreements. Uh, often the writer will create sort of the personality for the characters, but the artist will create the look and feel. Mm -hmm. uh, have any of you seen any particularly, I guess, well-worded or poorly worded aspects of those agreements? I mean, in case they, in case they dissolve, you know, you, you, the, the artist might then be left with characters that have a distinct look that they can't use, for example, mm -hmm. or that they just do use them without dialogue. Do you, do you See what I see? What I mean? Getting up there? Uh, yeah. Uh, there's sort of a controlling share. So, like, if you're the writer, or whatever, you control the property. It's your thing. You can establish percentages right. in the contract. And maybe you're yeah. you're doing media rights, like we're sharing media yeah. rights mm -hmm. with something, but right. we're not sharing yeah, the you property. Can, you can you can set up in your contract that you own the IP. The copyright is yours. Everything created for the IP is yours. But if anything is done with the IP in media or, or whatever, then the profits the from that are split whatever percentage you want yeah. between you and the other creators. The, the magic yeah. word is work for hire. You, you, in this case, you would be actually looking at the sure. other person being uh, work as work for hire, where you are, mm -hmm. you, you, when they get paid, they are now surrendering all the r future mm -hmm. rights you own it in its entirety because you're basically commissioning them to to write or draw or whatever whatever the aspect is. You own the intellectual property and you own the 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 underlying concepts as well as the actual completed work. Now Bob and I had a clause in our agreement where we could license from the other at an inexpensive rate so that uh, when I wanted to do a Duncan and Mallory, I just went to him and said, okay, got enough fan base interested in this. 
um, you know, will write something 10% or whatever, because he's not, all he's doing is just taking royalties. He's not writing or anything. And uh, sign off on that. It made it very easy. If he wanted to do a novelization of it, he could, again, have offered me a percentage, in essence, buying a license from me. And uh, that that worked out well. We never uh, we were in the process of doing this when he died, so it was never actually into fruition. But that worked out well. Uh, and even if people are not speaking to each other, that can still work out well. This question is actually for Jenny. Um, so I, 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 I know that you also do another comic, Givas on Parade, and, and I, I like that as well. But I, the question that was asked earlier, or was the statement that was made was, do the comic that you love. I noticed there hasn't been any updates with that one. I didn't know if you had <laughs> fell, fallen out of love with that one or not. And, I, I, and, and I, as a fan, I just wanted to know. I used to say that comic is, is not dead, it's in a coma. Um, right now it's in a five-year coma um, and I keep vegetative meaning state. keep this meaning to get state. well and it was the thing of, of learn to what learn to to do what you can live without um, the the comic the, the devil's panties gets updated every day no matter what I mean no matter what um, and so then that actually puts a lot of stuff by the wayside. And I do have a to-do list of I need to, to post more Keep Us On Parade and a second book of con artists and a second book of cats and a second book of all of them. Um, and so, so yeah, there, there's the do what you love and do what you can. Um, and there's also do what makes money. Um, I have a friend who has a, a full color uh, comic and she loves that one but the popular one is the stick figure comic and so she also does that one um, but but yeah there's definitely the, the things that you want to get back to because you love it but it's not necessarily your bread and butter and, and it is frustrating because the LARP comic has a niche market who are rabid <laughs> they come to panels and ask about it. <laughs> they they show up at conventions and leave me uh, letters in fruit, um, and sometimes the fruit ends with watermelon full of vodka. Um, so yeah, some sometimes there is a certain amount of of pressure from from readers of hey, we really liked this one character, we really liked this one thing, and and you have to listen to that and and get your butt in gear, and do it me. So, so yeah, um, I have no idea if that answered your question or not. <laughs> I think we're set, right? Well, that concludes Fonts on a Plane.